On behalf of Ridge United Methodist Church from the Lacocious's, Batty and Wes, welcome to Virtual Worship Ridge Style, and may you be blessed. Hi friends at Ridge, this is Tom and Ellie Mariner. Welcome to worship on this beautiful Sunday morning. We're glad you're here. Good morning, Ridge friends, and welcome to today's service. I hope that you enjoy it and that you feel God's blessings today and throughout the coming week. Welcome to Ridge United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Jared, and on behalf of our congregation, we want to welcome you to worship this morning as we gather today, turning our attention to Jesus Christ. You know, one of the, the, the reflections that the staff and I had recently was recalling the times that are included in the scriptures, as well as recognizing the many times that are not included of when Jesus and the disciples simply journeyed together. All those seemingly mundane moments when they were sharing in meals or walking to and from towns and villages and city, those nights where they stayed up late talking and laughing, the times they got up early and had not yet had their coffee and were grumpy. You know, Jesus lived his normal everyday life with his friends, with his disciples, even with his family. Some of those moments <clears throat> are included with script in scripture, but many of them, in fact, most of them are not. I'm reminded today, though, that this is the God revealed in Jesus who spends 
the normal, everyday, mundane moments of our lives with us. So friends, however you find yourself today, we trust that Jesus is with you, with us this morning. We trust that his promise is true, that when two, three, or more are gathered together in his name, there I am also. And so while we gather together in the name of Jesus, even from our respective places, we do so virtually and with one voice, giving thanks to the God who is with us every day in ordinary ways with us. Well, we look forward to the days when we can be together with one another again. We've been having more committee meetings, Bible studies, and gatherings in small groups here at the church. And we'll be gathering again together on the first Sunday of September, Labor Day weekend, for another outdoor worship service. We hope to continue those services as long as we can, weather permitting, as we head into the fall. But we do know for sure that weather permitting, we'll be gathering out in the yard again between Wilbur Wright Middle School and our building off of Columbia Street to gather for an outdoor worship service at 10 a.m. We hope that you and yours will be able to attend, and it's been so great meeting a number of you who have brought friends along with you. Uh, we have loved having you worship with us in person, and you who are joining us online, we're so glad to have you be part uh, of our growing and vibrant church community. Well, the other date I want to continue to put before you is the Sunday after Labor Day weekend. That's Sunday, September 13th. We're continuing to work toward being able to offer worshiping in person again. And just so we're clear, if you would like to continue to worship from your home, you may continue to do that. We will be broadcasting our services going forward. We continue to work out the technology, techno, technological difficulties we've been having. And most likely going forward, we will be streaming directly to the YouTube channel. Facebook have changed their platform, and that's causing issues with being able to live stream our services. So we'll be continuing to send more information out about how we can watch together on our YouTube page. With respect to that Sunday, though, we continue to have conversations about what that will look like. As a reminder, we will be practicing physical distancing, both in the sanctuary as well as throughout the rest of the building. We will be strongly encouraging you to wear a face mask while you are in the building in accordance both with the Governor, Governor Holcomb's mandate and also, more than that, in regards to Scripture's call on us to look out for the interests of others. And so, a way of practicing that discipline, we'll be wearing masks while we're in the building. We ask that you stay home if you aren't feeling well, or especially if you're running a fever or if you've been exposed to someone who is, has COVID. And the last thing, that while you are worshiping in the space, we will be asking you not to sing along during the worship singing time. Instead, we encourage you to hum or to listen to the rich and the praise band as they play, but science continues to show how singing projects the aerosol vapors further out through the mask, and so we want to just avoid any sort of potential spread that could take place while we're together. We look forward to that day, and we thank you for filling out the survey as we decide whether or not we want to just begin with one service continuing at 10 a.m., or if we want to try to go back to our 9 and 11 o'clock schedules. More information will be coming out this week as far as our next steps go on September 13th. Well, that's a lot of information, and we thank you again for your flexibility and for the ways you continue to move and pivot with us as we work hard to be able to be together again. We miss you. We look forward to seeing you and being with you soon. And so in that spirit, I invite you to stand where you are and to welcome those around you, either in your own home or sending a message to someone who God brings on your mind today. Greet them. We welcome each other as we sing together our opening song, hymn number 568, Christ, for the world we sing. Let us sing.
fill Christ for the world we sing the world to Christ we bring with fervent prayer the wayward and the lost by restless passions tossed redeemed and countless cost from dark despair Christ for the world we sing the world to Christ we bring with one accord with us the work to share with us reproach to dare with us the cross to bear for Christ our Lord Christ for the world we sing the world to Christ we bring with joyful song the newborn souls whose days reclaimed from error's ways inspired with hope and praise to Christ belong I invite you to join me in the call to worship the spirit is coming to bless us all with a new song let, Let our, our joy, joy be complete. complete. Gifts for the good of all poured out on all to teach us a new song. Love one, one another. another. Strangers and neighbors, foreigners and family will join in the new song. No, no longer, longer servants, servants, but friends. Come, let our worship make a joyful noise. Rejoicing, rejoicing in the friendship of God. God. Well, as we continue worshiping this morning, we invite you to worship God through the giving of your tithes and offerings. As usual, you may text the word GIVE to the number on the screen before you. You may continue to mail in your tithes and offerings. And of course, those who wish to give through our secure giving link may do so at bridgeumc.org. Just click on the word GIVE, the link above the top of the screen. However you choose to give, we invite you to do so with a glad and thankful heart. Scriptures tell us that the Lord loves a cheerful giver. For what are you grateful for these days? What brings you cheer? I've been thinking a lot about that lately, about the ways that I need to practice more spirit of gratitude and thanksgiving. In fact, recently I purchased a little notebook in it, I began writing just several things a day for which I'm grateful. There are many times when, if I'm not careful, I can get too down on the things I'm reading or seeing or hearing. I've been realizing that more often the voices that get me down are the voices that are not from God. So dear ones, as we lean into the discipline of gratitude, may we do so in ways that lead us to joy. Let's worship the Lord, and may you be blessed by the gift of song. Sometimes I
gently singing Our hearts in one accord Amen. Let us pray. Oh Lord, as Rich was singing this morning, I was reminded of that song, Alleluia, by Leonard Cohen, about how there are times, oh God, when it's a cold and it's a broken Alleluia. Lord, we recognize that many of us, if not all of us, ebb and flow in times when we are joyful and hopeful, and other times when we find ourselves in those valleys of despair and loneliness, depression, discouragement, God, we recognize that there are times when the best we can do is a cold and broken hallelujah. And so, Lord, as we give to you our tithes and our offerings today, we do so recognizing that there are times in our own faith journeys when, boy, it's just a discipline. It's a discipline, it's a commitment, it's one of those things that, that we just stick to it and hang on and we go through the motions sometimes, Lord, trusting and hoping and believing that through those disciplines, we will find joy somewhere along the way. God, even in scriptures, oftentimes we see in the Psalms when they begin in pits of despair and brokenness and disorientation. And yet, even when they're in the pit, there their spirit turns. They're still in difficult situations. They're not yet on the other side of what they're going through, but that does not stop you, O oh God, from changing their hearts and renewing their minds, to use the words of the New Testament. And so, God, as we offer to you our worship this morning, may you do the work only you can do in renewing our minds and our spirits and reorienting us toward joy. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, we continue now in a spirit of prayer, lifting up both those joys and concerns that are before us. I'd like to lift up just a few people from our own congregation, realizing that there are many other people in your heart and lives as well. But I want to start here and then think about maybe in concentric circles or ripples moving outward in our prayer requests for our community and our world. But let's start local. We lift up uh, Bev Fleming, who recently had knee surgery and pray for her full recovery. We also lift up those people in our congregation who in the last several months have moved closer to loved ones. We lift up both Ed and Sue Clawson, who are now in Illinois, living closer to some of their family members. We're so glad, Ed and Sue, that you're able to continue worshiping with us virtually. Uh, we miss seeing you, but are also glad that you are closer to your loved ones. And the same is true for Bernice Nance, who is now residing in Texas. Bernice, we love you and we miss you, and uh, we hope that you are doing well as you are getting resettled. We also trust that you will have a much warmer winter than the rest of us here. Well. Going beyond our own local congregation, we think and continue to pray for our community, and I want to continue to encourage and challenge you to be praying for our schools, our children, family members, certainly across the street here at Munster, but all of the school systems throughout Lake County who are continuing to try and evolve and adjust to a challenging beginning to their new school year. We're so proud of our teachers and our parents and our students especially, who, at least in my household, are oftentimes modeling this uh, much better than I am. So we pray for our students and our school systems. And then going one more circle, let's be praying for our country. 
You and I both know that a contentious election cycle is ahead and that politics in our nation are about as divided as they've ever been. I've been talking to some wise folks on both sides of the proverbial aisle who are experienced in their life and in their age, and they both lamented that this is one of the most difficult seasons in the life of our country that they can ever remember. And so let's be people of prayer, the people God calls us to be, as we remember our country in the prayers before our Lord. Well, friends, as we uh, prepare our hearts now, let us join together in that song, Spirit of the Living God. Let us sing. ascended into heaven, or rather right before, he said that he must go and that afterwards he would send you, Spirit of the living God, the third person of the Trinity, so that you might be in us in new and profound and more powerful ways. On Pentecost, you birthed the church, and ever since then, you continue to work in us so that you might work through us to the world around us. And so, God, it is in that spirit, your spirit, that we come before you, lifting up the concerns that are first on our hearts. Lord, we begin with ourselves this morning naming before you our shortcomings, our sins, confessing the mean-spirited thoughts that have crossed our minds, that have maybe even been spoken from our lips or typed through our fingers. We're sorry, God. For the times and the moments when we look more like the world than we do like Jesus, we ask that you would forgive us and that Spirit of living God, you would fall afresh on us, that you would melt us down, that you would remold us so that we decrease and you increase. God, we also ask that you who are the Holy Comforter would comfort those in our congregation who are discouraged, who are angry, who are sad, who are lonely. God, may you bless them, may you keep them, and may you remind them of your ever-present and steady arm. Sometimes, O oh God, we sing that old hymn, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. May you remind us of that truth, especially in those times when we're stumbling at the risk of falling down. May we lean on you and one another. We ask your blessing upon Bernice, upon Ed and Sue as they make themselves at home in a new house, in a new communities. We thank you for the ways that they have been wonderful 
and continue to be members of our Ridge family. We love them and ask nothing but your blessings and best be upon them. And we also ask for continued healing and strength for Bev and all who are recovering from surgeries or illnesses. May you keep them in your hands, O oh God. Continuing to expand from ourselves to our church, to their community around us, we lift up our school systems, especially those teachers and corporations and students and families in Lake County. May you guard their physical health and may you continue to help smooth out the rough places as we all work to adjust to a new school year. God, we thank you for all who are making difficult decisions, but who do so with the very heart and desire for nothing but the best but our little people. And finally, God, we lift up our country. Oh God, you call us to be reconcilers and ambassadors of Jesus. May we be such people in a nation deeply divided and in pain. We pray all of this as we join together and with you in the work of your ministry and in the work of prayer as we join together praying the prayer Christ himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and thine is the power and the glory forever. Amen. Spirit of the morning's reading is from the book of Acts, 10th chapter, verses 36 through 48. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. How he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses, and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So we ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Rick. I know that I asked you to read a really long scripture passage and I appreciate that. So thanks again. Let us pray. 
Open our ears, O Lord, to hear your word and know your voice. Speak to our hearts and strengthen our wills, that we may serve you and witness to others. Amen. So I have a question for you. Have you ever heard the phrase, preaching to the choir? Of course you have. It's a simple phrase that just means whatever I say, you technically already agree with everything that, that I'm sharing with you. And as Christians, we spend a lot of time talking to other Christians. I wonder why. Maybe it's because we're more comfortable holding a conversation about our faith with other Christians. Could be that it's easier to share commonly shared knowledge between one another or that we can be ourselves around other Christians, or maybe, just maybe, we tend to take the easy way out. You know, we prefer the simplicity of mutual understanding and beliefs. The thought of our faith being challenged or not agreed with could be terrifying, unnerving. In fact, it could be very uncomfortable. But God calls us to testify, to preach, and to bear witness to anyone unknowing of God's love and Jesus' sacrifice. Jesus commands us to baptize all nations, not rebaptize our own congregation over and over again. And to follow these rules and these commandments set out to us, we must have great courage and even greater strength in our devotion to God. For the church is the people. And the people need to use their lives to witness. So in our scriptures today, we hear Peter's having a conversation with Cornelius at his home. He called for Peter after God spoke to him during a time of fasting. There were Jews and Gentiles present at this time, and preach Peter preaches on God being for all nations. For that God denies his love to no one, ever. Peter also spends a lot of time sharing about all of the things that Christ has done for us already in that time and the purpose of it all. Once Peter has given all of this information to those who are listening, he calls to them and he challenges them to be and listen, to preach, to testify about what they've heard and what they believe. Peter spoke of the importance of all people being saved by coming to living faith in the life of Christ. Peter witnessed with his words to all people, not just a select few, any who heard could be witnesses to what Peter had to say. Now in verse 42, he's very specific. Peter says, testify that he is the ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. Testify, preach. That tells us Peter is calling all of us to tell the world who Jesus is, what he's done, and what he continues to do even in our lives today. The disciples were in a great position to testify because, you see, they had the first-hand accounts of Jesus. They were right there with him. They were there, and they were called to share the stories that they experienced with Jesus and then to spread the good news to everyone around them. As Peter reminded his listeners about the life of Christ, I want you to take a minute right now and think about what do you believe about Jesus? Now think hard. What do you know about Jesus? What do you believe about God and the Holy Spirit? When you testify, you share your personal story, your narrative. That's one of my seminary words. I learned that this week. You're sharing your narrative. It's all about how you've come to know God and who he is. What Jesus has done for you and what the Holy Spirit does through you and what life can be like when you choose to walk with Christ. Now, all of our faith developments are going to be different. Teachings and prayers and good God conversations and experiences and a whole host of other things in your life have brought you to what you believe. That belief is based on scriptures and life lessons and trust, and that molds you into who you are and where you are in your walk with Christ. Now, none of us are in the same place on our walk with Christ, but the funny thing is, is that where you are, God is there too. Jared's pace and my pace may be different, but God is with both of us. 
just like he is with you. Once you've reflected about your connection with God and where it all began and what you believe and how you feel about everything, I challenge you to share it. Give your testimony of faith. Now, it takes a lot of courage and strength to testify, but when you do, it can be life-changing. When you take time to think about where it all began for you, you start to piece life together. You can look at the good times and the bad times and how they come to weave into your faith journey. Looking back can allow you to see how God has been present in all things. I don't know how many times that I've reflected back on my journey and went, huh, now I see how I got there. Or, wow, I was really in a bad place, but God was there with me. And when you take that time to go back and look at those things, no matter how difficult it can be, and you start to take the time to recognize where God was in all of those things, you can see how he led you through those dark times. And you can't see it when it's happening. And that's why I encourage you to take that time to reflect back and think about where it all began and make those connections between you and God throughout your life. And as you unpack that journey, I want you to think about how could you share that with somebody? Because I want, did you ever consider that maybe something that you've gone through and you've made it through is something that somebody else is going through right now. It could be something that you share that helped them make it through and rely more on God during these hard times. I encourage you to find that inner courage to testify. Now, another way to witness to others is through preaching. Now, don't worry, there's lots of ways to preach. It's not just in one specific way. Because you all know that I never thought that I would be standing on this side of the altar. Public speaking is not my cup of tea, and there's plenty of you that remember when I used to stand up here, and by the time I was done, I was as red as they could be, and my hands were dripping wet with sweat. Now, not all of those characteristics have left me. I still get a little nervous from time to time, but here I am sharing God's message. Now, my preaching form comes in the way of word, scriptures and communications, interpretation, applications of God's narrative on our lives, on my life, on your life. But not all who preach have to stand right here. No, there's lots of ways to do it. One way is simply sharing a Bible story or a part of the gospel that's important to you. We love to tell the story of Jesus' birth, his healings, all of the miracles that we've read about growing up. I'm sure almost all of you can remember the first time you heard the story of Noah's Ark. Maybe it was Jonah and the big fish. Some of those stories resonated with you even as young children, and you can remember the time when you learned those things. Communicating that biblical knowledge that you have is a form of preaching because you're sharing God's word with others. Now, another way is through simple explanation. If you take time when somebody is having a conversation with you and maybe some of the pieces that are missing in their story and they didn't realize that there was other parts, not just one part of the Bible that they had learned, and you can fill in those missing pieces for them, that's another way that you are sharing God's word and helping others to connect with him. Now, sometimes preaching comes in forms that doesn't even involve any words. You can model your understanding of Jesus' teaching. Living the life that God commands, treating people the way Jesus taught us, are two simple ways to preach. Actions tend to speak louder than words. We all know that. And sometimes, as Christians, we kind of forget that. Because we say one thing, yet we do another. And it's important that those things line up together because if you think about it, if your actions and your words don't line up, it's a lot harder for a new believer or a non-believer to really believe what we're telling them. 
Conversations and behaviors have to line up for them to even remotely consider what we're telling them. And not, God is not calling us to be perfect because we can't always have actions and words that line up perfectly together. However, the harder we work on our walk with Christ, the better example we set for others. So when does one witness? When do you just decide, today's the day I'm going to share the good news because I feel it? Well, some days don't feel like that. But so how do you figure it out? How do you decide when you're going to witness? Well, when you witness, you know about an event, and it's because of a change in personal experience or observation. The disciples could witness pretty readily because they experienced a lot of the teachings of Jesus because Jesus was right in front of them. They had the personal experience because they saw it with their own eyes. They saw him do the healing. They saw the miracles. So for them to testify, they had the experience right in their hearts because they were right in front of them. The generations that came after the disciples had to rely on the teachings of those that came before them. Great models and teachers that teach us now how we can be witnesses. In Matthew 29, 19 and 20, most of you know this verse already, it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am always with you to the end of age. Testifying, preaching, witnessing, all of these things can accomplish this command. And we're not accomplishing it alone. And that's the part that Jesus makes sure that he puts in there because he's with us when we're doing all of these things. He's guiding us and teaching us and walking alongside of us, making sure that we are sharing the good news as we are called to. Jesus was a great model of being a witness. He went from town to town, and every time he showed up, here come the crowds. In fact, in Mark, he talks about he goes to the beach to share of the parable, many parables. And the crowd is so large that Jesus has to get in a boat and go out into the sea so that everybody would have the chance to hear what he had to say. He knew that his disciples needed to learn how to be a witness through him. So that's what he did, he taught them. He is the original model and teacher of what witnessing is all about and how we are called to be witnesses. Now during the time that we're in now, more and more people are in need of hope. Some of them are looking for hope in places that it's not going to be found. And it is our job to show them that best hope comes from God. Being the church, as the people, we have got to get up and witness to those people. Share the hope of Jesus. But how? Now, do you think that I would come up here and tell you all of these things that you had to do if I didn't have a plan? No, of course not. I always have a plan. So I have some helpful hints for you. So first, most important, is we have to keep up on our studies of God's word. Because the more we study, the more we learn, the more we know, the more confident we will be in discussions and conversations about our faith and the truth about Jesus. Second, when we share, we share in love. How often do you hear at family gatherings or at corporations, we don't talk about politics or religion, right? Why? Because all it does is cause arguments, it causes anger, it causes people to get on the defense. But when you share and you are in witness, the space needs to be one of openness, one of love. Then those essential conversations can be had. Now you can't force anyone to listen to what you say. However, if you share in a way that draws people into the conversation, even if they don't 100% agree, the conversation is being had and the good news is being shared. They may not want to agree with you in that moment, but you started the conversation. You're showing them 
who Jesus is and what it means to have a life with him. Another helpful tip that's one of my favorites is the use, allowing the Holy Spirit to use you as a vessel. In fact, Jared and I were just talking about this the other day, and for me, the Holy Spirit gives me the confidence that I need to share what I know. When I first started preaching, every time somebody was reading the scriptures, I would stand up here, shaking in my shoes, and pray this in my head. Holy Spirit, I am here for you. You brought me to this space, and I am the vessel for your words. More of you and less of me. Amen. That's what I would say. I would feel confident in myself that what was needed to be said in this space would be said because the Holy Spirit guide my words. I never had any doubt. Okay, well, maybe I had a little bit of doubt. However, the more I relied on the Holy Spirit, the more I realized that the message would be told the way it was needed as long as I let the Holy Spirit guide my confidence gained. I got better at being up here and knowing that the message that you needed would come through his words. And everybody hears what I say in a different way, and that's the Holy Spirit helping you to connect with the words that you need. See, the Holy Spirit, it uses us all in different ways. And if you give him the opportunity and invite him in to be with you as your guide and use you as a vessel, he'll be amazed at what happens. So my last tip that I have for you is to be bold in your faith. I know I've talked about this many times. Live out loud what you want people to see through Christ. In Romans 10, 13, and 14, it says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? This is so true. How is anyone going to know who Jesus is and what he does and how God works through our lives in so many miracle ways if our mouths are shut tight? People, I challenge you, live out loud. Let people see Christ through your words, your actions, your behaviors, the way you interact with other people, and the words that you share about Jesus. I know you can do it. Because if I can do it, you can do it too. You know, if you start with something simple, that's always a good way for you to get the conversation going. And the best way to start it simply is within yourself. What's your why? Now that's a sentence that every single professor at Christian Theological Seminary asks you when you first start in every single class. The very first day you write a paragraph of what's your why. Why are you here? What brought you to school? What brought you to seminary? But for you, the question is, what brought you to Jesus? Why are you a Christian? Now, sometimes that's not an easy question to answer. With all of the uncertainty and evil lurking around every news channel and media feed, we question our faith. We question our beliefs. Sometimes we question God and our connection to Christ. But by examining your why, you give yourself a chance to remember your journey so far and how present God has been through all of it. And it may not be easy. You may think of some hard times in your life where you questioned God and wondered if you even believed. And that's okay, because it's all part of the process. And when you find your why, the bond that you feel with God is stronger than you have ever, you could ever imagine. And with that strength, you now are empowered in your ability to witness to others what you've gone through, what your journey was, and how your life has changed because of Jesus. And through your words, your actions, your behavior, and most importantly, with love, 
You can have those conversations. You can be witnesses for Jesus. Now, do any of you remember when you joined the United Methodist Church? You had vows that you had to speak when you joined into the denomination, uh, whichever congregation you were in at that time. Now, some of you have been members for a really, really, really long time, and you're going to have to think back a little. The pastor may have said something to you, said some questions, and then you said, yes, there were prayers said, and boom, welcome to the denomination, you are now Methodist. When you had that journey, many of you probably heard these words. As members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service? Now, do you remember? Of course you do, because you said yes because you're all members of the United Methodist Congregation, and you did say yes, and we're very glad that you did, because you bring your gifts and your talents to this congregation. Now, when I joined the church in 2013, my words were a little bit different. There was a little bit of extra at the end. So when I was asked, I was asked if I would bring my prayers, my presence, my gifts, my service, and my witness. You see, in 2008, the lay leaders of the General Conference voted to have this phrase added to the baptismal covenant. Covenant. I always say the wrong word. It's covenant. If you go back in 2009 on the Discipleship Ministry of the UMC website, you'll find an article that's called Giving Witness. Jesus calls us as disciples to share what we know. As Christians, we can witness to the knowledge we have of Christ Jesus and the meaning that he has for our lives and can have for the lives of others. Our response to simple questions like, do you go to church? Are you a Christian? These are great opening questions to start a conversation about Jesus. We can share with one another what we know in those two simple little sentences. If they ask the question, they must want to know. And that's your in. The article goes on to state that we need to give it all for the cause. I don't know about you, but I cannot think of, of a better cause to put all of my efforts into. In fact, John Wesley made it very clear on how to give it our all in Wesley's rule. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. That's a great rule to live by. Think of all of the different ways and places and spaces and things and actions you can do to be witnesses. Now the best way to get good at witnessing is to look back at your, con your connection to God through your membership at the United Methodist Church. So today, I invite you to renew those vows. With this renewal comes a reminder of your Christian faith. Why you love Jesus so much, how badly you want others to know of God's grace and mercy, and through your connection to the United Methodist Church, you have the tools set in front of you by John Wesley himself, he just told us, on how you can share Jesus with the world. So if you look in your bulletin or on the screen, you will see all of the words that we are going to share this morning. Now, the bold words are going to be for you and for me together. So I'm ready for us to renew, refresh our faith. It's time to commit and say that we will be faithful as witnesses. So on the screen, I invite you to join me in the renewal of your membership vows. So I ask you. As members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, say, I will. I know I will. Please join me in the response that's on your screen. We give thanks for all that God has given you, and we welcome you in Christ's love. As members together with you, and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, 
we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. The God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. Amen. So as our time this morning is wrapping up, I have one more thing that I want to share with you. In John 1, 10 through 13, it says, He was in the world, and not, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what is his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, or the will of the flesh, or the will of man, but of God. Do you feel the love that God has for us when you hear those words? Friends, I invite you to witness to the world. Share the good news of Jesus Christ. Those words are words that everyone needs to hear. They all deserve to know that God loves them. And we need to be witnesses to them. Let us pray. God, set our hearts on fire to be witnesses. Help us to see how important it is for us to be your disciple. Speak to our hearts, Lord. Encourage us to use our mouths to testify and preach your hope to the world. Amen. Now, I invite you to rise, if you would like to, and join us in our closing song. So let's fire up our hearts and remember how much we love to tell the story of Jesus. Oh, it 
best. Seem hungry and thirsting to hear it by the rest. And when in scenes of glory I sing the new, new song, to me the old, old story that I Thank you.